Okay, we're going to get going, and our first speaker is Tina Annunziata. She's a graduate from the Georgetown University Medical School, and she came to NCI to work with Lou Stout, and uh, she's currently an investigator at NCI in the medical oncology branch. Her title, Ovarian Cancer in the Genetic Genomic Era. Tina. So use this mic for now? Okay. Okay. So thank you for that introduction. Actually, uh, my branch has changed, and it is the... Uh, I can talk in this. It's fine. Because um, I can see my slides. I don't need to walk. Uh, I'm actually in the women's malignancies branch, um, which I moved to after being in the metabolism branch where I studied uh, lymphoid malignancies. Uh, but now I'm in uh, women's malignancies and studying ovarian cancer. And how do I advance this? I do it like this. Here we go. Okay, so just some background. I'm going to do some background on ovarian cancer um, as an overview, and then I'll talk more about like some more recent uh, clinical trials with more targeted therapies and more genomically driven clinical trials. Um, ovarian cancer is the most lethal gynecologic malignancies in the U.S. with greater than 16,000 deaths per year. It's the fifth most common cause of cancer death for women. Um, and this is because 70% of cases are actually diagnosed with advanced stage disease, which is kind of the reverse for breast cancer. It's a much more common disease, but uh, probably 70% of breast cancer or more is diagnosed at the early stage, uh, early stage breast cancer, which is much more treatable. So ovarian cancer is much more uh, in the advanced stage disease at the time of diagnosis, and less than 35% of advanced stage patients will be alive at five years. <clears throat> the stage is defined... Uh, by uh, the Federation for um, Gynecologic Oncology. Uh, stage 1 is confined to the ovaries, and as you can see, uh, that occurs in only 20% of the situations. Um, <clears throat> but those women have a 90% chance of long-term <clears throat> survival. Excuse me. Um, stage 2 is beyond the ovaries but confined to the pelvis, so that's uh, sort of an arbitrary distinction. It's not an anatomic distinction. So as you know, the pelvis is contiguous with the abdomen. So to be confined to the pelvis is really, uh, you know, just based on is it still below your hip bones or is it all over your abdomen. Stage 3 is uh, beyond the pelvis. And stage 4 is distant metastasis, meaning lung or uh, invasion into organs such as the liver. Um, and in uh, stage 3 and 4 disease, the overall survival, uh, long-term survival is much less. So what are some prognostic features of ovarian cancer? Um, of course, the stage at diagnosis is what I just told you. The extent of cytoreduction, and I'm going to talk a little bit more of that in a couple of slides, but cytoreduction basically means um, how much tumor you can remove at the time of initial surgery. So how much is gone? Can you remove 100% of the visible tumor, or is, can, is there situations in which the doctor, the surgeon cannot get everything uh, is it inside of an organ? Is it right next to a vessel? Is it in an area that can't be resected? Um, histology and grade, uh, we'll talk about that again in a, in a couple of slides. So the grade is how, uh, how de-differentiated the tumor is. Histology, uh, I'm going to talk about it in a, in a little bit. Performance status of the patient, so how uh, active is the patient, how sick is the patient at the time that the surgery is done. Um, whether P53 is mutated, and that has a lot to do with the histology. Uh, how, how well their organs are functioning and how basically how active they are, their physiological age. Um, the upfront therapy we'll talk about is platinum and taxanes as an initial therapy. Intraperitoneal therapy is a novel uh, approach to delivery of the same agents, platinums and taxanes. Um, whether you get information from a second leg surgery, whether the patient has a genotype of a hereditary cancer with the BRCA mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2 and uh, VEGF production. So the treatment for newly diagnosed ovarian cancer is complete surgical staging. So uh, go into the abdomen, open up, look where, this, where the cancer is and whether it's involved in uh, lymph nodes or distant metastases. Um, optimal cytoreductive surgery, which is basically getting everything that you can get out. Uh, chemotherapy, and, of course, um, clinical trials. 
So complete surgical assessment, full assessment of the abdomen and pelvis is done at the time of surgery with random biopsies of visually negative areas to see if there is microscopic disease in those areas. And those are usually lymph nodes, um, surface of the liver, or uh, other lining of the bowel or the peritoneum. Lymph node dissection is routinely done, except in clearly, clearly stage one confined to the ovary cancer. Um, uh, just a just a background on where the cancer goes. So in the ovary, in the in the abdomen, the ovaries are located in the pelvis. Um, the circulation of peritoneal fluid, so not fluid that's in the vessels, but fluid that circulates, bathes the abdominal structures, uh, that circulates in a um, in a clockwise direction. So in the abdomen, the first place that the tumor is going to go is sort of to the right and up is going to lodge on the outside of the liver. So typically during uh, ovarian cancer surgery, the surgeon will take scrapings from the underside of the diaphragm. Um, the surgeon will take uh, samples around the liver and will remove uh, various parts of the abdomen. Um, removal of the omentum, as it's written here, is uh, is typical because that's again another place, the next place where the uh, cancer cells will lodge. Um, removal of the paraortic lymph nodes, pelvic lymph nodes, and of course um, the uterus and cervix are typically taken out. Peritoneal washings will be done to see if there's any free floating cells as well. And that will give you a differential if, if the patient is given a stage A, B, or C within one, two, three, and four. Um, the uh, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Sorry. The removal of the, of the omentum is typically done because that is where things can stay. That, that's where uh, cancer cells can sit. Um, so an optimal cytoreductive surgery is uh, in stage one and two, complete removal of all the disease. In stage three and four, optimal is uh, fairly arbitrary again, but it's less, residual disease less than one centimeter. Most of the times, uh, cancer surgeons are trying to get out everything, and of course that gives you a better prognosis if everything can come out, but uh, if they can leave less than one centimeter of disease, that's considered optimal. And this is why, because if you look at the survival of people, this is actually a, quite an old slide, but um, if you look at if, uh, if the patient was left with greater than two centimeters of disease, there is a much, much worse overall survival than if the patient was left with zero uh, zero centimeters, no microscopic, no macroscopic, excuse me, no macroscopic disease. So this is the goal of surgery is to get out all of the disease. Um, but even so, there can still be microscopic disease, which is why we have to use adjuvant chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is given after the initial surgery typically. However, in some situations, uh, ovarian cancer uh, chemotherapy can be given neoadjuvant or before the time of initial surgery. Uh, the classical uh, chemotherapy regimen is platinum, and that can be either cisplatin or carboplatin in combination with a taxane, which is either paclitaxel or docetaxel. docetaxel. Um, intraperitoneal administration of the chemotherapy is given if the patient has stage 3 optimally reduced uh, uh, ovarian cancer. Uh, just a quick background on the timeline of treatment. Uh, in the 1960s, basically the five-year survival for advanced disease was essentially zero. That was before um, we had uh, effective chemotherapy. In the 1970s, cisplatin was introduced, and there was a 5% long-term overall survival. So the addition of chemotherapy to the optimal cytoreductive surgery is uh, shown to be beneficial. In the 80s, there was the addition of um, a combinations with with uh, platinum chemotherapies. Um, but it wasn't until the 1990s that the taxanes were approved and introduced into the upfront therapy of ovarian cancer. And uh, that gave a pretty dramatic, I would say, um, increase in overall survival. Still only 35%, but much better than zero, of course. Much better than even single agent cisplatin at 5%. Um, the introduction of the intraperitoneal administration of the uh, of the chemotherapy did give another an additional benefit out to 40%. And, uh, oh, this is what I was going to say on the previous slide, that the ovarian cancer tends to spread um, within the peritoneal cavity and not through the lymphs. 
lymph nodes, the lymph system, and not through the hematologic system. And this is why we see the effect of intraperitoneal chemotherapy, the initial benefit of intraperitoneal therapy, is because it's really taking care of the disease at the site of disease, as opposed to the intravenous chemotherapy, which uh, is taking care of you know, disease that would be metastasizing through the intravenous system. Um, the intravenous chemotherapy does reach the peritoneum, but when you give it in the peritoneum directly, you get a sort of a higher exposure within the peritoneal cavity. And this is, this is why we see the spread of ovarian cancer. It does not go to the lungs um, or to the bone like breast cancer does. Uh, breast cancer spreads through the blood, and that's why it lodges in the bones and the blood. Ovarian cancer spreads through the peritoneal cavity, and only then does it invade through uh, the the cystic, the, the structures in the peritoneum. So the addition of, I'm going to skip that slide, the addition of intravenous chemotherapy was uh, tested formally in this trial called GOG-172. GOG is the gynecologic onco oncology group, which is a cooperative group that does multi-institutional phase three trials. So this trial tested standard intravenous chemotherapy with cisplatin and paclitaxel versus uh, intraperitoneal chemotherapy with cisplatin given intraperitoneally, paclitaxel was given intravenously and intraperitoneally. So the reason for that is that when you give cisplatin intraperitoneally, it almost 95 to 100 percent gets absorbed into the uh, intravenous system. So from the peritoneum goes into the blood, so it circulates throughout the body as well as getting exposure to the peritoneum. The paclitaxel is given in a very, very hydrophobic vehicle that cannot, is a, is a giant molecule that cannot get into the bloodstream. It does not get absorbed from the peritoneum into the circulation. And so it was thought that we should not be, uh, you know, uh, robbing patients of standard therapy, which would be the intravenous paclitaxel. So we did not want to, uh, you know, not give them standard of care. So this is standard of care plus an additional intraperitoneal administration of the paclitaxel. But some people argue that we are giving overall a higher dose of paclitaxel to a, the total patient. You can see in the, in the top versus the bottom, the bottom are getting an additional 60 milligrams per meter squared of, uh, of paclitaxel. Interestingly, another thing that's interesting on this slide is only 42% of the people in the intraperitoneal arm were able to complete six cycles. And that's because it's, it's fairly toxic. I mean, people get a lot of side effects when you directly give chemotherapy into the abdomen. So you can imagine there was a lot of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, uh, just a lot of side effects that made it impossible to give people, some people, um, all six cycles. But even with that, only 42% of the patients getting the whole six cycles, there was a substantial increase in uh, overall survival. And this is a slide, of course, this is uh, uh, almost eight years old now. Um, there's been updated data where this sustains. But there was a dramatic increase in overall survival from 50 months to more than 65 months of uh, overall survival in, um, when the intraperitoneal therapy was given. <clears throat> so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and go back, get, get a little bit more into the biology of ovarian cancer. So in those trials, we're grouping all ovarian cancers together. But we now know that there's lots of different types of ovarian cancer. Um, even at that stage, we knew that there was uh, different histologies. So what it looks like under the microscope, 80% of the times it looks like serous cancers. 10% um, of the time it looks like... Uh, it comes from the endometrium, so it looked like endometrioid uh, uh, histology. 5% <clears throat> of the time it looks like a clear cell, so it looks like a, like a kidney cancer. Um, and 3% of the time it looks like mucinous, so it actually looks visibly like an uh, intestinal cancer. Um, so you can imagine that probably these all have different types of biologies. And uh, what we don't know is even where are these cancers coming from? Is the ovary, they, we, when we look in the abdomen, there's a mass on the ovary, so we call it ovarian cancer. But is it really coming from, from the ovary? What is really the tissue of origin? So nowadays, we're thinking that based on molecular studies, uh, perhaps serous cancers are originating from the fallopian tube and not actually from the ovarian epithelium itself. Um, endometriosis so from the endometrium might be giving rise to endometrioid or clear cell cancers. 
and uh, uh, overall a malarian epithelium might be just uh, just in general from a developmental standpoint all of this is malarian epithelium um, growing in an extra uterine fashion so of course, we think that increasing our understanding about the biology and the biochemical events underlying the ovarian cancer uh, will create avenues for new treatments. Should we treat all of ovarian cancers the same, or can we find some more targeted, directed therapy for different biological subtypes of ovarian cancer? And that brings us to the ovarian cancer in the genomics era. Um, of course, the, uh, we probably all know about the Cancer Genome Research, uh, Cancer Genome Atlas Research Network, which published their um, study of ovarian cancer in uh, 2011. Um, the Cancer Genome Atlas looked at clinically annotated high-grade serous, so only the high-grade serous types of ovarian cancer, to identify molecular abnormalities that influence pathophysiology, affected outcome, and potentially gave us new therapeutic targets. And what they did was uh, they did microarray analysis on 489 of these, looking at messenger RNA, microRNA, DNA copy number, DNA methylation, and uh, 316 of them did whole exome DNA sequencing. Uh, they included only newly diagnosed patients, which is, I think is a key point. Can we really extrapolate this to the recurrent setting, which we tried to do but doesn't necessarily always apply. Um, only uh, serous adenocarcinoma, as I mentioned, no prior treatment. Um, it could be any surgical stage or histological grade, uh, but the, predominantly they were stage three, uh, stage three cancers. Um, and each frozen tumor specimen had to have a companion normal uh, tumor specimen, which could be either adjacent normal tissue or uh, peripheral blood lymphocytes with extracted germline DNA. Uh, the data collection you can look at, you probably all know, from tcga.cancer.gov. This includes demographics, histopathologic information, treatment details, and outcome parameters. And this is sort of the workflow of what they did. This is from the publication. Um, interestingly, uh, what they found was that the most frequent mutated gene was P53 in these serous cancers. So that sort of defines now serous cancers, looking back at this. Um, the next most common gene that was mutated was BRCA1. And you could see the vast difference in the number of cases that had P53 versus the number that had BRCA. And these, of course, are not mutually exclusive. Um, so almost all of them had P53 mutation, but um, only, I would say, less than 10% had the BRCA mutation. And then after that, it falls off a lot. Uh, it falls off quite quickly after that. There's a lot less frequent mutations that were identified. <clears throat> From a copy number standpoint, looking at the uh, chromosomal copy numbers, um, it looks that you can see compared to uh, GBM, which stands for glioblastoma multiforme, which is a brain tumor, um, compared to GBM, which has very distinct copy number gains or losses, uh, high-grade serous ovarian cancer has diffuse uh, genomic abnormalities throughout the genome. And here is a red is, is amplified regions, blue is deleted regions, and um, the chromosomes are listed 1 through 22 from uh, top to bottom. So you can see throughout the genome there's, there is a, a vast number of uh, DNA copy number abnormalities. However, what we're finding now is that the 3Q um, gain and the 5 where am I looking here? The 5Q uh, loss seemed to be a recurring feature of this high-grade serous. There's more on that uh, that's being talked about right now. Not a lot of definitive targets, of course, but um, that's an area of interest to study. From a gene expression standpoint, uh, they were able to identify four different gene expression subgroups using uh, all 489 tumors and grouping them by uh, 1,000 different genes. Um, and they found that there was a differentiated, an immunoreactive, a mesenchymal, and a proliferative signature that defined these subgroups, um, which were simil similar to uh, subgroups that were identified in this Reference 25 data set that was published back in 2008. Um, so what are some altered pathways? So how do you put this all together? 
you are looking at the DNA copy number, the mutations, and the um, gene expression signatures, what they noted was that in 67% of cases, the RB signaling pathway was altered. Uh, in 45% of cases, the PI3 kinase and RAS signaling pathways were altered. So you can see that using this large, uh, large amounts of data, you can kind of come up with pathways that are affected and not necessarily individual genes. Um, and this will come into play when, when coming up with therapeutic targets down the road. Notch signaling pathway was another recurring theme in uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas. And um, uh, homologous recombination, so HR standing for homologous recombination. Uh, and this is related to the BRCA uh, germline mutations and uh, as well as um, the DNA methylation pattern that were, seemed to be silencing the BRCA1 and 2 gene loci. Uh, another pathway that we, we kind of, in, they're integrating here, cell cycle progression and DNA repair pathways with multiple mutations or aberrations found in all of these. And this is kind of trying to tie in the, the issue that, <clears throat> excuse me, that P53 was mutated in almost, in almost all of the cases. So uh, just to summarize, the Cancer Genome Atlas was a large-scale integrative view of aberrations in high-grade serous uh, subtype of ovarian cancer. And what they found was that mutational spectrum was what they call surprisingly simple. P53 was mutated in 96% or in 96 of cases. BRCA1 and 2, when combined, was 22% of cases. But the other ones were, uh, were very, very infrequent, so 2 to 6% of cases had other significant mutated genes. Um, from, the other, from other literature, not in CCGA, we know now that uh, this high-grade series is distinct from other histologic subtypes. In clear cell, for example, in different publications, there were very few P53 mutations, but there were recurrent mutations in arid A1 and uh, PI3 kinase. Um, in endometrioid type ovarian cancer, there was frequent beta-catenin. Uh, mutations, some ARID1A and also uh, much more PI3 kinase compared to clear cell. In mucinous, there seems to be prevalent KRAS mutations. So a very distinct types of ovarian cancer. We look at, in the past, we treated them all the same. In the future, probably, we won't be treating them all the same. But that has yet to come. Uh, some other quotes from the TCGA paper, there was a remarkable degree of genomic disarray, <clears throat> as I mentioned, with the GNA copy number aberrations, strikingly in contrast to the glioblastoma, um, and uh, mutations and promoter methylation in DNA repair genes might be related to these copy number aberrations. So where does that leave us? Do we have new therapeutic approaches? Well, there were at least 50 percent, probably more than 50 percent of the cases had uh, homologous recombination defects, DNA repair defects. So can we treat them with PARP inhibitors? I'm going to talk about that next. Um, commonly dysregulated pathways might also provide opportunities for therapeutic treatment. Um, again, those are still in the clinical trial setting. Um, inhibitors for 22 genes in regions of recurrent amplification. Um, but then the other issue that uh, was sort of introduced here, can we, uh, can we target the networks rather than the genes themselves? Um, in order to be an effective treatment, do we need to target multiple pathways, multiple regions of these networks? Can we target a central core of these networks? These are all questions that are raised by, this, by these data. So that brings us to the next sort of precept of uh, treating newly diagnosed ovarian cancer. Uh, clinical trials, and how can we incorporate targeted therapies. So I mentioned PARP inhibitors. PARP inhibitors are more commonly used nowadays in BRCA mutant cancers, not yet, not yet FDA approved, so these are all still in the experimental stage. But what are PARP inhibitors and where do they fit? So normal processes of the cell uh, being alive, uh, cellular metabolism and environmental exposures, lead to single strand breaks of the DNA. Um, PARP is critical to the repair of single-strand DNA, single-strand DNA breaks. In replicating cells, if PARP, uh, PARP needs to be there in order to, for this, uh, the single-strand break to be repaired, if it's not repaired at the time of replication, the single-strand break actually gets converted to a double-strand break. That's a PARP inhibitor. In a normal cell, the normal cell can repair uh, the 
double strand break by a pathway called homologous recombination. In BRCA deficient tumors, homologous recombination is knocked out, and so there's no repair of the uh, double strand DNA break that leads to uh, catastrophic consequences, and the cell dies. So Olaparib is uh, uh, sort of the the uh, what's the word I'm looking for the uh, novel PARP inhibitor, sort of the the keystone of the PARP inhibitors. It's the most studied in the lab and also in the clinic. Uh, it's an orally active PARP inhibitor. It has synthetic lethality in the lab in homozygous um, BRCA mutant cells. Um, we did a phase 1B study of Olaparib in combination with carboplatin to sort of uh, push along the DNA damaging. We used a carboplatin as a chemotherapy to induce DNA damage in the BRCA mutated uh, cancers. And we used Olaparib to block the PARP uh, to promote selective death more highly in the cancer cells compared to the um, uh, normal cells. So our results, we enrolled 45 patients, uh, 37 of them had ovarian cancer and 8 had breast cancer because the BRCA gene um, gives you predisposition to both ovarian and breast cancer. Uh, we had a phase 1 dose escalation period to find the correct doses of Olaparib and carboplatin in combination. Um, and we had a phase 1B expansion cohort with 15 patients at the maximum tolerated dose to look at uh, what is going on in the patient's uh, cells and what's going on in their tumors, and what's going on in their peripheral blood and what's going on in their tumors. We did note that the uh, maximum tolerated dose of, of uh, carboplatin was a dose of AUC5, which is nearly the dose that you would give as a single agent, you would give AUC of 6. We gave that on day 1, and we gave Olaparib 400 milligrams twice daily on days 1 through 7, and that was repeated every 21 days. And we did find a remarkable response rate in uh, all these patients. These are, the color coding is by the dose level. And you can see we had an expansion cohort at the dose level 6, which was the maximum tolerated dose. So there's more red patients than the other colors. But even at uh, the intermediate doses, uh, dose levels 3, 4, and 5, we had a number of, uh, most of the patients had um, either stable disease or a substantial reduction in their disease, which is defined by uh, greater than 20%. Uh, reduction in their disease is considered a response. And we did have one patient actually that reached uh, a clear, uh, complete response, which is 100% of her disease went away. These, I should note, are patients that had been, all of them have been previously treated with carboplatin, and all of them recurred uh, after carboplatin, and some of them even were refractory to carboplatin, meaning they had disease growing while on single agent carboplatin. So, um, so this is quite a remarkable result that the addition of the PARP inhibitor gave most of these women a response to just, carbo, just uh, carboplatin alone. Uh, this is a little bit small, but this is just to summarize that, uh, as I mentioned, um, one patient had a complete response and has been on, uh, stayed on study for 23 months. This is most recently published um, this past June in uh, JNCI. Um, most patients had a partial response or stable disease and uh, six patients had progression of disease. So the overall response rate was 87% um, in the breast cancer and 44% in the ovarian cancer. But if you include a uh, response rate and, and stable disease, meaning keeping their disease, stopping it from growing, um, we had a clinical benefit rate of 82% uh, in ovarian cancer and 100% in breast cancer. Um, so to conclude, oral Olaparib was well tolerated in combination with carboplatin in the regimen that I described. Um, it was highly active in advanced chemotherapy refractive BRCA deficient cancer. Um, greater activity, of course, was seen at the higher doses, but it was positive proof of the concept of the activity and tolerability of this genetically defined uh, targeted therapy with Olaparib in the BRCA deficient cancers. Um, so moving, uh, moving to the gene expression, that was, a, that was an example of a specific gene mutation that led us to a targeted therapy. Um, how can we use the gene expression subtypes, so sort of more of the network pathway uh, approach to looking for targeted therapies for subtypes of serous ovarian cancer? Um, we started looking at the immunoreactive subtype, which was defined by a, a set of, uh, of uh, 200 genes here in this green subtype. 
And when you look at those, when you take those 200 genes and look at what are the networks that are involved in this, in this uh, set of genes, the NF-kappa B complex comes out as one of the most predominant uh, networks that's uh, influencing these, uh, that's putting together, that's bringing together these set of 200 genes. Um, so what is the NF-kappa B pathway? NF-kappa B you probably all are familiar with, but just a, this is a very brief schematic overview. NF-kappa B can be triggered by um, uh, cytokines such as TNF when signaling through its TNF receptor, um, activates a complex that involves TRAF2, TAC1, and CIAP uh, to then trigger phosphorylation of IKK beta, which is I-kappa B kinase beta. Um, that's a kinase that's involved in a, that's a part of a heterotrimeric complex of IKK alpha, gamma, and beta. IKK beta is the predominant molecule that phosphorylates inhibitor or I kappa B or inhibitor of kappa B alpha. That is a protein that binds um, the transcription factors, the NF kappa B transcription factors themselves. So the NF kappa B are actually transcription factors that need to translocate to the nucleus to activate the genes of uh, interest. However, in the inactive state, they're held in the cytoplasm by I kappa B or uh, inhibitor of kappa B. And uh, IKK beta is what phosphorylates and targets I kappa B alpha for degradation in the proteasome. That degradation then releases the transcription factors to go to the nucleus, bind to the DNA, and uh, promote transcription of NF kappa B target genes. And if kappa B target genes themselves are involved in, involved in survival and proliferation of uh, cancer cells and uh, of normal uh, cells as well. So we first started out by looking, well, are any of these uh, transcription factors actually even expressed in ovarian cancer? What is their relationship to survival? We found in two different studies, one study we found that uh, NF kappa B P50 transcription factor was uh, associated with worse overall survival in a, a group of patients that we had long-term uh, ten-year follow-up on. We also looked at the expression of the IKKs and said, uh, asked whether the expression of IKK, any of the IKKs, were was associated with survival. And we found that overexpression of IKK beta itself was uh, associated with worse overall survival in a different data set. So we wanted to look at uh, what is NF kappa B. How do we study NF kappa B in ovarian cancer? So we moved to a preclinical model to look at IKK beta signaling, uh, NF kappa B signaling downstream of IKK beta in the ovarian cancer in a preclinical cell line model. So we treated the cells with IKK beta inhibitor to define uh, the pathway specifically in ovarian cancer. And uh, we we used actually an IKK beta inhibitor, and we also used shRNA to. Um, IKK beta and came up with a gene signature that defined NF kappa B signaling in ovarian cancer. And what's interesting about this signature is that these are all known NF kappa B target genes, but they are, seem to be specifically co regulated in ovarian cancer. And what I mean by that is shown on this next slide. In large data sets of gene expression from ovarian cancer patients, this is just one of them, but we've done this in three different data sets now. Um, if you look at the co-regulation of these genes, these genes are tight, very tightly uh, coordinated with each other. If you look at genes that are other NF-kappa B target genes, for example, ones that are called NF-kappa B target genes in multiple myeloma, which we looked at back in my uh, previous life when I studied multiple myeloma, um, those genes are very dysregulated in ovarian cancer stable. So they don't sit together themselves. They don't define a signature. They define a signature in multiple myeloma, but they do not define a set of patients in ovarian cancer because they're just, they're not regulated, uh, they're not co-regulated, basically. Um, in these, these particular NF-kappa B target genes are specifically co-regulated in ovarian cancer. So we can now use these as a tool to study ovarian cancer data sets um, and find out what's going on with, with NF-kappa B in ovarian cancer. And what we found in these data sets was that there was a worse overall survival when the signature was expressed at a level higher than the median uh, compared to those cases where the signature was lower than the median. So it seems like it might be important. We then did a whole body of work in cell lines and looked at proliferation, survival, inflammation, adhesion, invasion, and angiogenesis and found that nf kappa B uh, blocking nf kappa B by blocking IKK beta actually was important in cell lines in this situation, um, in all of these situations. And uh, that was related to the known functions of the NF-kappa B target genes. 
But if we take a closer look on the proliferation, so it doesn't really look like, so it did define a subset of cancers that were sensitive to IKK beta inhibition, but IKK beta inhibition was not really uh, killing the cells. It was a kind of a slow death. It was not a dramatic death. It had a broad effect on all these functions, but it did not, it was not actually promoting active cell death like apoptosis. So we went to look in a different part of the pathway. So just backing up, what is apoptosis? There's the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis, and there's the extrinsic pathway of apoptosis. So what I'm going to point to here is the molecule SMAC, which stands for second mitochondrial activator of apoptosis, of uh, caspases. And uh, SMAC acts in both actually the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway um, to promote the uh, apoptotic cascade finally ending in cleavage of caspase 3. But the importance of SMAC is that it actually, its function is to inhibit the inhibitors of apoptosis or the IAPs. And if we take that back to the NF-kappa-B pathway, SMAC there, uh, let me just take you back to the NF-kappa-B pathway, you note that IAP is one of the molecules that I pointed out in an earlier slide that's important at the level of uh, TNF receptor signaling to promote the activation of IKK beta. So, I, so the SMAC mimetic, so we're going to use now, we're looking at a drug called a SMAC mimetic, which is also called Brinopant. But the SMAC mimetic is a drug that is a peptidomimetic of SMAC, of the endogenous SMAC itself. And the SMAC mimetic downregulates IAPs. So we thought that we could downregulate the NF-kappa-B signaling by downregulating IAP but we could also then promote apoptosis and another activated cell death pathway called necroptosis by this pathway. So this MAC mimetic comes in, blocks the IAP, which then releases the block on the RIP kinase, which is downstream of the TNF receptor in its pro-apoptotic sense to activate apoptosis. So RIP1 can then activate the endogenous, the, uh, the extrinsic pathway or the intrinsic pathway by activating uh, caspase 8, and then leading multi-steps downstream to activating apoptosis. RIP1 can also uh, turn off NF-kappa B. <laughs> I mean, the IAP is turn off NF-kappa B. Sorry. RIP1 can also activate another pathway called necroptosis. So if you have cell cancer cells, which typically have defective apoptotic pathways, um, we have another pathway of promoting cell death via RIP1, to activate a programmed cell death pathway called uh, necroptosis uh, via a separate mechanism that doesn't depend on caspase cleavage. So we used the uh, SMAC mimetic in combination with TNF and, uh, and an IKK beta inhibitor, actually, and we found that there was increased cell death uh, in ovarian cancer cells when we treated with all three together. This is still in vitro. Um, we inhibited that cell death with an inhibitor of apoptosis, which is shown in the gray bars. That's called ZIETD. That's actually inhibiting specifically caspase 8. Um, and we did almost completely rescue the cells. We also inhibited with a uh, NEC1, which is a specific inhibitor of RIP1 kinase, um, which, uh, act, which blocks the necroptotic pathway. And we found that there was rescue of the cells uh, to a lesser extent, but still some rescue of the cells there. So we would hypothesize here then, we would state here that the, uh, the treatment with TNF, IKK beta inhibitor, and SMAC mimetic were actually uh, killing the cells by both apoptosis and necroptosis. So we thought that this might be a good way to uh, treat ovarian cancer patients. So we, uh, of course, there's much more preclinical and, uh, and uh, animal models, but I'm skipping a lot of that. Uh, eventually, we took that to a phase two clinical trial using the SMAC mimetic in platinum-resistant ovarian cancer uh, patients. And here, the drug is noted by the, the light blue arrows. So the drug is given on a weekly basis for three weeks out of four. We did uh, core needle biopsies of the tumors before starting treatment and after six doses of the SMAC mimetic. And we did restaging CAT scans shown in the gray bars uh, every two cycles. We did multiple correlative studies using uh, both the frozen tumor, fixed tumor, and um, plasma, as well as peripheral blood mononuclear cells, and, uh, um, and uh, whole blood for what's going on with the immune cells. 
And I'm just going to briefly summarize two findings that we had here. We found that the, in the tumor biopsies and the PBMCs, the SMAC mimetic effectively hit its target. So it effectively downregulated the, the, the protein expression of IAP1 in both the tumor biopsies and the peripheral blood mononuclear cells that we took from the patients at the time before starting treatment and then after uh, six doses of the, of the drug. So that was good. So the drug actually hit its target. But what happened to the N of kappa B pathway? Well, in the uh, peripheral bun mononuclear cells, um, there was good uh, sustained downregulation of N of kappa B signaling. The way we measured N of kappa B signaling here was the phosphorylation of P65 subunit um, and that ratio of phospho P65 to the total P65 um, in, these, uh, in these samples. Um, but what we didn't see was downregulation of N of kappa B in the tumor biopsy. Um, we're still investigating what is the, what is the reason for that. Um, why, when we've downregulated IAP, why did P65 not come up? And there are multiple reasons why, uh, not go down, sorry. There are multiple reasons why that might happen, um, and we're, we're looking at that right now um, in the lab. But we didn't, uh, we didn't see the downregulation, nor did we see actually tumor response. So these patients were treated with the SMAC mimetic for uh, at least two cycles, some of them stayed on for six, but we never saw tumor shrinkage. We did not see the apoptosis that we were looking for that we had seen in the, in the cell culture. We did not see that in the patients. And we are, the ongoing studies are going to investigate that. Um, but there are multiple SMAC mimetics in the clinic right now, and they all have kind of have similar responses. Why is this? There, uh, there's not very good clinical activity of the SMAC mimetics. Um, there's basically stable disease for uh, most of, the, most of the, the clinical trials that have gone on right now. Um, there were complete responses in two patients in one study, and that's uh, going on to a phase two. So uh, we'll see what's going on there. But um, a lot of promise in the lab and disappointing clinical activity, I think, is the main summary of, <laughs> of the SMAC mimetic story. Um, what we're doing in the lab is trying to take this uh, for a step further Maybe we can't induce apoptosis when treating with just single agent. Is that a pharmacological reason or is that um, a biological reason of, in the tumors? So we're now looking for um, combinations that we can do with the SMAC mimetic to enhance its activity. And here we did a screen with, uh, with the NCATS, which is National Center for the Advancement of, Clinical, Advancement of uh, Translational Sciences. And what they did first was to generate a six by six matrix. What we're doing on the, uh, sort of on the y axis, we have the uh, SMAC mimetic, and on the x axis, we have uh, the experimental drug. And they had a library of 476 compounds that we tested in the six by six matrix. Um, we then chose the uh, most synergistic combinations and expanded those to a 10 by 10 uh, matrix to confirm and, uh, and then look for uh, sort of pathways that are affected there. Uh, synergy was defined by a, a, a combination index of less than 1 and a beta parameter less than 0 0.5 in the BLISS model. And what we found was actually now coming back to um, the pathways that are, that are disrupted, these, uh, these agents fell into multiple, into sort of categories of drugs. The ones that we found that were synergistic with the SMAC mimetic were actually categories of drugs. Um, the taxanes came up as uh, one category of drugs. We also had spindle protein inhibitors, topoisomerase inhibitors, pololykinase inhibitors, HDAC inhibitors, and, and uh, various uh, other, uh, other miscellaneous drugs. So what we're doing here to take this back to the clinic is we're going to focus on uh, docetaxel combination with the SMAC mimetic to see if we can get more cell killing in vivo. This is an in vitro study that, of course, shows that it confirms the synergistic activity of the combination. Um, so we, are, we do plan on going to a randomized phase two clinical trial of docetaxel versus the combination of docetaxel with SMAC mimetic in women with platinum-resistant ovarian cancer. Um, we will be looking at NF-kappa B signaling and seeing if we can categorize women uh, by the level of NF-kappa B signaling that's present in the tumor before starting, um, and then what happens to the signaling afterwards. Um, so that is, those are sort of two scenarios that, uh, that I... Um, can present. Of course, there are many other uh, vast clinical trials ongoing in ovarian cancer. Um, 
but I just wanted to highlight some of the research that we're doing here uh, in a targeted manner, in a subtype specific manner for ovarian cancer. And with that, um, I'd like to just highlight uh, the women's cancer uh, team and uh, translational scientists who did much of this work in the laboratory. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, these are all questions, right? I mean, we, we think we have a, a way. Uh, that's why I wanted to show you, like, a successful trial and a not successful trial. We think we know what's going on in the lab, but it's much more complex in vivo. So whether that patient simply had, like, upregulation of MDR gene, you know, and then just pumped out the drug and the drug never got to the tumor, that's one reason why it could happen. You know, there, there's many reasons why... Uh, why these could happen. I mean, I think they're all fascinating to study on an individual basis, and that's kind of what we're moving towards. Can we just do whole genome sequencing? Can we just profile individual patients that are sort of the outliers to find out more about who's responding and who's not responding? That's an excellent question. So are they just deletions? Are they different mutations? Is that what you're asking? Um, so we haven't looked in detail in that. But that is an excellent point because the mutation, all mutations are not the same. So some of them actually, some P53 mutations just completely knock out the function of P53. Some mutations actually give P53 a different function. And so are the mutations responsible for this um, aberrant cell cycle for this aberrant DNA repair mechanism for the genomic instability. And I think that is, a, that is an area of research. We're not actually doing that directly in the, in the NCI, but lot, that's, that's an ongoing research outside of the NCI. People are looking at, at those questions. But that's, a, that's an excellent, excellent point. So, yeah, so a lot of tumors have P53 mutations. So that, this is another, I think, a huge benefit of the Cancer Genome Atlas. So we have all these, all this information. I don't know if you saw the speaker on Friday for Grand Rounds. Um, we have, I think, like 17 cancers that have been profiled now by all these methods. And so now we can sort of try to pick up what are the similarities and differences between these cancers. And what that investigator found and others have found is that the uh, serous ovarian cancers look very uh, similar on the P53 spectrum and the BRCA spectrum to triple negative uh, basal-like breast cancers. So there seems to be some similar, and the, the 3Q loss and the 5Q amplification, that was also consistent across uh, both basal breast cancers and, um, and, uh, and serous ovarian cancers. So yes, yeah, so it, they do occur uh, throughout those type of cancers. The uh, KRAS mutations that we see in the mucinous cancers tend to mimic KRAS mutations in colon cancer, um, for sure. And um, uh, the clear cell ones, the arid one a happens in clear cell kidney cancer as well. Um, so yeah, so there are recurring, there are recurring themes. That being said, I mean, there still is something to tissue of origin, because we know, like in the KRAS mutations, um, for example, the ovarian cancers with the KRAS mutations don't really respond to the same chemotherapy regimens, for example, that the colon cancers respond to. So there is some, you know, there's, there's similarities, but then there's differences just because of the tissue type as well. So we have to keep that in mind moving forward. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So we have... Uh... One announcement, that being last week, I sent all of you an email about the uh, cores and the tumor boards. So you should respond by the uh, end of the week um, if you're interested in that activity. And then we'll be visiting the cores and the tumor boards between Columbus Day and Thanksgiving Day. 
So our next speaker is Melinda Merchant. She got her MD PhD at the University of Miami School of Medicine. Then she did residency training at the Children's National Medical Center in pediatrics. She joined the pediatric oncology branch as a clinical fellow in 1999. Then she went to uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and then she returned to the pediatric oncology branch. She's now a staff clinician. Her title, Immune Checkpoint Inhibitors, Overview of Immunotherapies and the Potential Translation for Pediatric Solid Tumors. Melinda. Last year in Science Magazine, immune checkpoint inhibitors was listed as the biggest advance in cancer treatment. Okay, thank you. Good evening. I was asked to talk specifically about immune checkpoint inhibitors, and I thought I'd do a couple of things with this talk. One is really broach immune checkpoint inhibitors, but in the broader context of immune therapies, and also teach you a little bit about the angle that I'm coming at. As many of you know that immune checkpoint inhibitors have had some exciting results in melanoma, but what many of you may not know is that pediatric melanoma exists, and that some of the other tumors in pediatrics uh, can be targets for the immune system. And so we're going to go through those today. And uh, as Dr. Moody mentioned, the Science Magazine named cancer uh, immunotherapy the breakthrough of the year last year. And I've really divided it into a couple of groups, um, which we'll touch base on. Immune stimulation, before we even knew what some of the basic science that's been learned in branches around here, laboratories here and elsewhere, uh, we had nonspecific activation. As we've grown a little bit more uh, complex, we're using cytokines to treat and antibodies and complement uh, fixation. There's adoptive cell transfer, which is well studied here in the NCI surgery branch with tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Um, and some exciting news on the horizon for TCR therapies, uh, even against solid tumors. Uh, we have an ongoing trial using NYESO against synovial sarcoma. And CAR T cells certainly making a hit in the leukemia field, but also um, using CAR T cells against solid tumors, both in the surgery branch, the ETIB, and um, well, the ETIB is in leukemia, and our pediatric oncology branch with uh, GD2 CAR T cell. And then autologous or allogeneic NK cells, which have been activated and can attack. And these are all ways that we are using a very active strategy to put cells in and attack tumors. There's also been many uh, years of vaccine strategies attempting to vaccinate patients against overexpressed proteins, cancer testes antigens. I already mentioned NYESO um, as one of those in a target and the fusion proteins. Many of the tumors that we treat in pediatrics have a transfusion protein, um, which essentially takes two genes, puts them together, and you have a very unique target within the cell that's not in any of the normal tumor cells. But we're still trying to understand how best to target things like that. And then the immune checkpoint blockade, which we'll get into uh, in much more depth today. I wanted to start with a little history. It was mentioned that I spent time at NCI and went to Memorial and came back. That's a lot like the path of immunotherapy takes. There's a lot of Memorial uh, Sloan Kettering and NCI history in immunotherapy. And one of the ones who's sometimes referred to as the father of immunotherapy is William Cooley. He was a bone sarcoma surgeon and head of the bone uh, tumor service at what became, well, a Memorial Hospital and New York Cancer Hospital and later became Memorial Sloan Kettering. He took care of Bessie Dashiell and actually that was probably one of the things that, that led to a lot of work in the area and Memorial Sloan Kettering and Rockefeller Center because this was a teenage friend of John D. Rockefeller Jr. 
and really put the impetus for philanthropic uh, giving specifically toward cancer treatment and the sciences and uh, really became the foundation of what would be Rockefeller University now doing some very great clinical trials work. And so I, I really want to highlight here the importance of philanthropy, which uh, we also uh, work often with in pediatric uh, cancer. He was a 19th century surgeon, so he had 19th century tools at his hand, but he noticed that sometimes patients, after he did surgery on them for their bone tumors, had a better overall survival when they got an infection from surgery. And uh, last week, I opened up my Twitter feed and saw a uh, Twitter feed about the NCI's new exceptional responder initiative. And so in the Twitterverse, this is really the 21st century version of it. But in uh, William Cooley's day, his version was actually going down to lower Manhattan into the tenements and searching for a patient that he'd found in a record that had a sarcoma, had an erysipelas, an infection with strep afterwards, and supposedly left the hospital without any evidence of tumor. But he wanted to follow up and make sure that that indeed was true. And so he searched for a long time, found this Mr. Stein, a German immigrant living in lower Manhattan. And here's the picture of him seven years after that event where he was still free of tumor. And so I like this quote in one of the books um, about, whoops, I spelled Cooley like a redskin there instead of <laughs> like the toxin. Um, Nature often gives us hints of her profoundest secrets. And so I just encourage you guys as you are looking, and part of the rationale behind a course like this is because sometimes those little points, which may not have seemed so big, can be the foundation of a a scientific path that could take centuries to come to fruition. But don't despair, you graduate students <laughs> and postdocs. It can also lead to some very exciting things. Keep your, keep your observational caps on. And I think that this uh, idea of exceptional responders was also talked to uh, about Dr. Annunziata. Those patients, why are they responding really well in clinical trials? Mr. Stein was one of those. I have here in your handout just a pause to say some of the things that much of this is coming from. You'll see this isn't my typical science talk or very detailed about all of our clinical trials. This is really more an overview. And it started with history. And the commotion, A Commotion in the Blood is a great book by Stephen Hall that really gives a good overview background to immunotherapy. Um, it'll have things about the young uh, Dr. Steve Rosenberg. They'll have things about Cooley's toxin. And it really goes through some of those things. It's a nice narrative and actually um, balances well uh, as the emperor of all maladies as well in talking about some of the history of immunotherapy. There's a couple of uh, recent reviews that are very interesting and, and sort of briefer to get a broad overview. Uh, Drew Pardall from Hopkins and Jed Wolchuk from Memorial Sloan Kettering are leaders in the field of immunotherapy and immune checkpoint inhibitors. And uh, they both have recent uh, reviews, as well as some um, uh, reviews coming out of the Rosenberg Group. And uh, Gajewski was here a couple of weeks ago for CCR Grand Rounds and gave a really great overview of some of the inflamed phenotype that I won't spend a lot of time going into, but that's worth going back and looking at as well. And he has a nice review uh, in the last uh, year or so. I'm going to take a pause now and walk you into a little bit of the pediatric world. So adolescent and young adult melanoma is actually the second most common adolescent and young adult tumor. Here you see from a SEER uh, monograph listing all of the tumors and their percentages in patients 15 to 29. And I've highlighted melanoma in 11%, soft tissue sarcomas and bone tumors make up another 11%, and that's another uh, forte of our branch and, and specialty of mine. But melanoma, this is one age group where it's increasing in incidence, and it actually is not very well studied at all because it's pretty rare. There are low rates of trial enrollment in adolescents and young adults, um, more so for the young adults. The adolescents tend to get captured on children's oncology group studies or other pediatric oncology studies 
The young adults, not often. There are some risk factors, probably in the teenagers and young adults. There are some sun exposure issues that may play a role in melanoma. Um, but there are certainly some genetic predisposition issues that set up a, a pediatric patient to be more likely to have melanoma. One of the biggest is uh, what's called a large congenital nevus. These are um, birthmarks, essentially, that cover huge parts of the, of the skin. They're big nevi, sometimes referred to as swimming trunk because they really can look like a set of swimming trunks on a patient. Uh, and the patients within that area are much more likely to have a melanoma develop. There are familial melanomas, which are uh, studied in the DCEG. There's xeroderma pigmentosa, dysplastic syndrome, atypical nevi, are all other setups that you can see the link between uh, skin and melanoma. Immunosuppression, though, is also a setup, and so is a pediatric cancer survivor, probably for a lot of what we put them through to get rid of their first cancer, they are now more at risk of having a melanoma. There are definitely lower numbers of patients in this AYA group than in the adult population, and I'll show you a couple of, um, of graphs about that. And then there's the referral pattern about whether they actually end up getting to pediatric oncologists or um, uh, dermatology or adult oncology referrals. And then there's a lot of psychosocial uh, challenges to this age group that's really just on their way to independence and they get this total roadblock of a cancer and a rare one at that and an aggressive one at that. So here's a list that I was promising, a graph showing the incidence of malignant melanoma versus other cancers. And you can see where we tend to spend most of our time treating patients is down in the very low numbers of melanoma and low numbers of cancer overall when you're looking at the numbers of patients like ovarian cancer or lung cancer. Um, we're going to talk about much smaller trials than you just heard about in the talk right beforehand. Overall, there's about three or 400 cases of pediatric melanoma in the year, and about 10% of those are going to be metastatic, making it an incidence of about one per million. Um, this is 1.5 per 10,000 for overall cancer in the pediatric age group, or four in 100,000 for ALL. And it represents only about 1.3% of the total melanomas, but again, a decent number of them in the teenage years. So when I came back uh, about five, six years ago now to the, to the MCI, I came back as a solid tumor, sarcoma-focused, um, immunotherapy and molecular-targeted um, translational uh, clinician scientist. That's a whole bunch of adjectives. But it ended up making me a melanoma doctor, too, because our interest in immunotherapy left these patients uh, an option to get treated with things that first were not approved uh, in the clinical trial setting. And we be actually became a referral pattern for melanoma patients and have probably seen more uh, metastatic melanoma patients in the past five years than um, have been in other places. You'll see, to get the sort of numbers that have distant metastases, it was over a span of decades at other uh, large referral centers. There's not a national registry, but uh, we are in the midst of writing a, uh, a natural history trial that will help us to get some more of the genomic details that we're uh, starting to get on our um, current studies. So of interest, the majority of our patients that have shown up have had head and neck or scalp uh, neck. This was in a, a nevus of ODA, which happened to be on the head um, that this uh, patient's melanoma developed in. And that's a way higher percentage of head and neck cancer than you see in the general melanoma population. Um, most of these patients did not have sun exposure um, at, to those areas. And I honestly don't know yet whether it's biology or the fact that it gets covered by hair a lot and takes longer and probably as at deeper Breslau levels and um, at a higher stage before it gets first found in the question of why do we have more of these in our metastatic population than you do if you look at overall at the entire SEER database. They're in pretty much the typical places that melanoma goes in the adult, which is to say anywhere. And they can be very big and palpable, as in this young girl, um, and can grow to be very disfiguring, but can also go to multiple places within the body. 
The genetics have been a very big story too, because the other thing that's been approved in the last couple of years for melanoma is our BRAF inhibitors and MEK inhibitors. And so in looking at the amount of patients uh, with mutations, it's about similar in our older population to what you see in the, in the adults, which is there's a decent number of BRAF V600E mutations. This is about 50% in some of the studies. It's a little bit less here. Um, NRAS, these tend to be in the younger patients and uh, more associated with those nevi than necessarily uh, anything that looks a little more typical adult. Some of the other things that you see in cutaneous melanoma, such as CKID or P10 mutations, we have not identified in any of our patients. And we have identified some other mutations through work with uh, Mari Yohi, who is a fellow, uh, pediatric oncology branch fellow, and Javed Khan, who's her mentor in the oncogenomics lab, um, have identified that have helped us to treat the patients. I mentioned sarcoma. And I want to stick with it, but I won't spend as much time giving you a little bit of history of sarcoma because it's a very heterogeneous group. But two of the key uh, sarcomas that we tend to treat are osteosarcoma is a bone sarcoma, and the second most common bone sarcoma is Ewing sarcoma. Interestingly, James Ewing, who Ewing sarcoma is, uh, is named for, was the pathologist at Memorial Hospital when Cooley was there at the same time. Um, and Bessie Daschle likely had what we now call Ewing sarcoma. And so there's a lot of rationale behind why we think sarcomas can also be targets of immunotherapy. And I just want to capture a couple. I couldn't go quite back as far in my own history um, as for William Cooley, but this is one of the um, first papers I published as a fellow uh, that really sort of sets the stage to show that osteosarcoma can be a target of T cell cytotoxicity. If you have a mouse that has no T cells or a mouse that has T cells, they grow a primary tumor just the same rate. There's no difference in that. They look the same when they come out. We do an orthotopic tumor implant, put it down in the gastroc, and you'll see uh, this guy in his portrait. You can see it sticking out on his leg here. We actually amputate that leg and then wait, and uh, the majority of patients will end, or majority of mice will end up developing lung metastases over the next couple of months. But if you give them T cells, either give them after the surgery or before the surgery, T cells that are able to make interferon gamma, those mice will survive and not get metastases. We also did a study in the branch um, which has recently uh, come to about a five-year survival rate that we can look at. And that's using high-risk sarcomas as the target for immunotherapy that included a dendritic cell-based vaccine. Um, when the patient was first diagnosed, they came and we got a cell harvest that got us lymphocytes and a tumor biopsy to make the lysate. They went back and they got regular standard chemotherapy. Standard chemotherapy for these high-risk sarcomas are months of high-dose chemotherapy, five uh, different drugs, surgery and or radiation. So you really do a lot, but in these pediatric sarcomas, we can get the patients to what we call no evidence of disease, actually in the vast majority of the patients. Unfortunately, a metastatic patient at diagnosis has a less than 20% survival rate because they recur and they're harder to treat once they recur. So what we did was we brought them back after their standard therapy when they had no evidence of disease on their scans and we gave them an immunotherapy, which uh, had their monocytes grown up into dendritic cells, fed their own tumor lysate, given back to them as a vaccine together with recombinant human IL-7, which was driving the T cell expansion. And then we watched. And this is an example of one of those patients. Uh, Ewing sarcoma can end up very widely metastatic, uh, much like melanoma. And this is a PET scan showing a lot of bony disease. She had a kidney, arm. She had a lot of disease. Went through the standard therapy. The immunotherapy, she was actually one of the first patients that didn't get the IL-7 and actually remains NED to this state um, six years later. And in fact, has had some very um, exciting things happen in her family life this year, too. We're, we're actually very excited that this is the first time we're sort of moving some of these very poor survival rates. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve. 
This was a uh, 1986 trial of metastatic high-risk uh, Ewing sarcoma patients. Here is one uh, where we use that fusion protein as a peptide vaccine, and we didn't, uh, we didn't move that survival curve much with that peptide vaccine, but when you change it into a lysate vaccine with cytokine, and uh, the dendritic cells, we have actually have um, a majority of the patients surviving on that study at this point. So these are really to set the stage for the fact that we think sarcomas are a very good immune target, melanomas are a very good immune target. Now what can we target in that immune tumor interface? And I want you to also think about it as a very dynamic interface. It's not just a single interaction. Um, Alex Wong, uh, who had been a fellow here before and is at Case Western, has some beautiful pictures of T cells just going in and out of lymph nodes and just bopping around sampling and looking. It's very, very dynamic. And the bone tumor itself, bones are not stagnant. They're living and growing. So the, all these things and forces are going on. And can we take advantage of the things that are making T cells get into a tumor better? Or can we knock down things that are keeping a T cell from getting in there? And our sarcomas, we've got a lot of myeloid-derived regulatory cells suppressing the environment. The tumors themselves are secreting things that tell the T cells kind of turn off. Melanoma tends to get T cells in there and you can grow it, but the question is can you keep them activated and fighting against it? And with sarcomas, one of our questions is how can we get more T cells in there because we're not able to grow TILs from sarcomas very well at all. But really, can we help bolster this part of the immune system to eliminate the tumor? Which, flipping it on its head, you can ask in a different way. What keeps immune surveillance from happening, and how can I make a, an impact on that? And I just mentioned some of these things, the myeloid derived suppressor cells, the Tregs. Cancer antigens don't tend to be as strong as, as viral antigens. Um, Tumor cells like neuroblastoma, one of their classic ways is they just downregulate self. They don't put so much MHC out on surface so that they cannot sort of engage as well um, the immune system. For solid tumors like sarcomas, there's the actual physical barrier. And there's Ira Pastin has done some work on actually how much can get in due to the oncopressures, essentially. So there are definite um, uh, problems along the way. But one of the things the tumor cells uh, has been able to do is to exploit these negative checkpoints. There are some tumors like osteosarcoma that actually have CTLA-4 on the surface. There are other ones that have PDL1, and we'll get to what exactly that is in a little bit, but that's the ligand for one of these immune checkpoints that essentially helps to put the brake on the immune system. So if there are ways that the tumors themselves are putting a brake on the immune system, can we block that? so we can now have the immune system attack the tumor. And that's what we're going to focus on here with the immune checkpoint. There's a whole bunch of other areas of this immune interaction between host and tumor that I think are very useful and we're going to see things come out in many of these areas. But for right now, we're going to focus on, um, on some of these. CTLA-4 is in here and PD-L1 and PD-1 are the classic ones. So let's step back a little bit and talk about just T cell activation. Now, I'm a pediatrician too, so I tend to try to put things in very uh, concrete ideas so that my patients can understand as I talk to them about why we're doing a certain thing. So I figured I might have some immunologists in the room. Don't be offended that I'm taking it back to very basic steps. Hopefully you learn something about pediatric oncology as well. So essentially, a T cell takes a couple of signals. The ignition is signal one. That's where the TCR um, binds the MHC that has a peptide in the groove. Jed Walchuk talks about this as putting the keys in the ignition. Signal two is the co-stim, and that's the gas pedal. That's CD29 binding B7 here and sending a second signal, which essentially makes IL-2, your T cell activation, your interferon gamma, all the things that make a T cell good and active. Now, if you have a T cell that's activated all the time, the body says, wait, maybe that's not quite so good. 
And so actually, after 24 hours of chronic antigen stimulation, it sends CTLA-4 to the surface of the T cell. CTLA-4 is that break that basically binds to B7 with higher affinity than the normal positive second signal to send a negative signal. And that inhibits the activation of the T cell, and it essentially blocks further activation of it. If Belumumab, or Yervoy is the brand name of it, or Tremolumumab is the metiimmune version of, of um, this, if Belumumab is BMS, monoclonal antibody it blocks CTLA-4, so it no longer binds to B7 with a higher affinity. It inhibits that break and allows the activation to go on. So notice what we're doing in blocking an inhibitor. We're not turning the T cell on. The T cell had to be turned on already in its stage. We're not helping the T cell get to the tumor any better. It had to be able to get there. But basically, we're blocking a break that's been put on for the body's own homeostasis and say, let this continue attacking that antigen because, yes, it's sticking around, but it's important that it keep attacking it. This is uh, from Jim Allison's uh, first uh, report in science on CTLA-4 blockade. He gave colon cancer um, to mice and essentially implanted it back here. And you see it starts being palpable. And all of them grow. This is something to get back to as we talk about the, the, um, the clinical trials themselves. But essentially, you've got some growth. But the ones that are treated back here with just three doses of anti-CTLA-4 have a regression of that palpable tumor, and it goes away. Whereas they don't when you block the other side of the, um, the co-stim. This is uh, one of the first clinical trials done with uh, what became ipilimumab. It was a surgery branch trial. And essentially, you see here uh, a large melanoma uh, metastasis. Here are some smaller ones. Here's a brain met. And here they are in the second panel, basically all going away. And there are several um, complete resolutions and partial resolutions that were reported in this trial of um, melanoma tumors. It was also tested uh, here at NIH by um, uh, Dr. Yang as well in that group on renal cell carcinoma. Here is the pivotal, whoops, the pivotal uh, phase three trial that led to its approval uh, using ipilimumab in patients with metastatic melanoma. Essentially, it looked at uh, ipi versus uh, vaccine with GP100, which is a melanoma protein, versus IPI plus the vaccine. And, um, and uh, we'll get into some of these other ones later. But essentially had stable disease, overall responders, and, um, and a prolonged survival rate. These are really, instead of pulling out a lot of things from the early reports, which tended to be in New England Journal and tended to make very big splashes at ASCO the year that they were presented. I actually pulled the, the two recent year, um, well, I guess this, this is two years old, and this one is within the past year, long-term follow-up of patients on the trials. So here was the um, surgery branch trial. And you can see that essentially there's a plateau of patients who are long-term survivors to getting the initial upfront doses that block that uh, checkpoint inhibitor. This did not require years of treatment. This simply released the break at the beginning of treatment. And then these are patients who have had ongoing um, clinical responses. In the surgery branch trial, they did it with IL-2, which, uh, tended to be, which ended up being their best survival arm, versus with GP100. Uh, Plus, minus, I can't read that so well here. Yeah, so versus the ones with the vaccine. Whereas the IPI trial, the phase three that Jed Walchuk published, has a um, IPI plus GP100 here in red. IPI alone was the better uh, responder. And the vaccine alone was the poor outcome. And what you see is as some take home, you can uh, tell from 
McDermott's drawing on his figure here, which is that really in the first three months, they don't separate. So if you're testing this drug and asking for typically what we would ask for, like on the PARP inhibitor trial that uh, Dr. Nunziata just showed you, we want it to respond. Stable disease isn't really the take home they were hoping for there. We want it to shrink. But in this case, if you would close down that study based on these not moving apart in those first three months, you would have missed what ends up being a separation because of long-term um, inhibition of that break for the immune system. If you look at patients who responded but grew and now take them out of the non-responder group, here's a patient who's responding, uh, who's not responding, sorry. And they basically are starting to have disease and progressing and they follow what tends to be a more typical curve for melanoma. Unfortunately, most of them look about like this in their survival curves. If you look at the patients who had some sort of response, they're much better. They, follow, they go out on a plateau, and there is some uh, dropping out, and there's a lot of censored ones here, so I take this with a grain of salt. There's a lot of patients out here at the uh, essentially two to three year mark. But if you look at the patients who initially progressed, but when you looked at them in a different sense and said, I'll let you progress a little bit because if immune cells come into the tumor and grow some, that might be a good thing. And maybe I don't want to cut off and just go to some chemotherapy that will abrogate what's going on. Maybe those are the patients we can just watch. And sure enough, if you just watch those, they end up looking a lot like the patients who have had responses. And so there are now for clinical trials of immune checkpoint inhibitors and quite frankly for other immune uh, uh, therapies, immune related response criteria that takes that into account and lets what used to be very small and barely showing up on our, on our study grow to be seen on our study but not take a patient off trial. So here's a summary of the experience in the adults uh, essentially as we started the pediatric trial. It had improved survival in metastatic melanoma. It had a dose effect. At 0.3, they didn't have any responses. At three milligrams per kilogram, which is the approved dose, um, they had 4% responses. But at 10 milligrams per kilogram, they had 11%. Uh, now, um, what I don't have on here, I guess, um, is the immune-related adverse events also tend to go up with that too. And what do I mean by immune-related adverse events? When you block the checkpoint, I've said nothing in any of that about blocking it specifically for the tumor. If we had a way for me to block it specifically to, for tumor, that would be great. But we don't at this point in time. Maybe some bispecific, maybe there's some good things coming out of the basic science labs that will help us discriminate a little bit more. But right now, it's just pulling the brake off of anything. So if you have a tolerization of a T cell by this mechanism, you are likely to release what will look like autoimmunity or immune reactivity against uh, self. Some of those most common places, colitis diarrhea because of inf inflammation of T cells in the gut, very much like graft versus host disease. Hepatitis, we can't always prove that it's because of autoimmune issues, but lymphocytes in the liver causing issues um, to the liver. Rash is very common in adults. I'll show you soon that it's actually not so common in kids. Um, and endocrinopathies. Thyroid, it's actually pretty easy to make antibodies against uh, your thyroglobulin. So anti-thyroglobulin antibodies are something that we look at in a lot of patients, and a decent number of patients on these studies will make antibodies that create some problem with their thyroid system. They take a Synthroid replacement, and it works out okay. The more complex one is something called hypophysitis. Hypophysitis refers to a T cell infiltration and swelling of the pituitary gland that essentially knocks off a lot of the access of your endocrine system, talking to your adrenals, talking to your thyroid, and it can lead to lifelong need for replacement in a lot of different hormones. But one thing that we tell the patients is that breaking tolerance to self 
means that at least you're getting the mechanism to work. And across a couple of studies, if you had a better, if you had an adverse event that was related to an immune activation, you were more likely to have an anti-tumor effect. So if you've unblocked tolerance to self, you're more likely to have unblocked tolerance to cancer, which after all is pretty darn close to self. It is self, just a little altered. So this was our study. We treated uh, one-year-old to 21-year-old patients with essentially every three-week ipilimumab for induction and then went out to every four, uh, every three months for uh, maintenance therapy. We started at a lower dose level, not quite as low as the adult studies had shown since they had no responses there, but at one milligram, three milligram, five milligram, and 10. And this table essentially shows you how we had increasing immune-related toxicities as we went up. In bold are the ones that are called dose limiting and made us back up on certain things. But you'll see pretty much all the things that we talked about show up here. There wasn't any new safety signal. There wasn't anything different that was happening in the kids. But honestly, before we embarked on this, we had never used any of these agents in children and didn't know what the pediatric immune system would do in response to um, the immune checkpoint inhibitor. We didn't have any home runs. Uh, we had five patients with stable disease. Actually, I think it's six. Um, greater than four months. One out of 12 melanoma patients was in that stable disease. I mentioned the toxicity trial is similar. And this uh, was the foundation for a promised uh, phase two study in adolescent melanoma that's ongoing now. This is one of our patients. She had a very bulky scalp melanoma. You'll see here at baseline uh, in a couple of different sequences. And essentially, after 15 months of ipilimumab, it had decreased in size. Uh, she developed an autoimmune thyroiditis. Her um, lymphocyte count went up at this time. And by treating her with Synthroid, the antibody titers came down. No, her disease, uh, the TSH, came down. But um, we could tell after a while that her antibody titers were coming down about the time that we start to see her tumor growing again. So we reinduced her with ipilimumab, gave her that intensive again, and once again sort of stabilized out the, um, the disease and we saw an increase in the antibodies as well. She ultimately went on to progress, um, but was our longest responder. Here are the, the rates of uh, um, side effects, grade three and four being the worst uh, players. And about a third of the patients had a grade three or four. This is uh, consistent with what was seen in the adult studies. But again, this one was not. Maybe about 70% of the adult um, patients had a rash of some sort. And we were puzzling over this a little bit until a dermatologist pointed out that what we all pretty much know, that adults have a lot more skin damage, UV damage in their skin than kids do. And perhaps it's that target of the mutations that happen. And, and Dr. Rosenberg just came out with a paper in the past year identifying that in uh, some of his tills. You could really see each one of those induced changes can be a target for a T cell. And those can be even in non-malignant tissue in your skin causing a rash. Whereas the kids, they don't have that, so they didn't really have the T cells going to their skin. It's a hypothesis. I haven't proven we didn't biopsy anybody, but I think it makes sense. So the conclusions are that you know it was pretty much tolerated, similar to what was seen in the adult studies. But we did have less clinical activity than we had hoped for. We only had the one long-term SD in all the melanomas we treated. And when we looked at the biomarkers, and I'll show you a couple of them, there really wasn't any clear-cut thing, which is hard because normally you like to take a biomarker and say, who responded? <laughs> and how is that different from the non-responders? Um, so we're hopeful that we have uh, responders on our anti-PD-1 trial, uh, which is uh, upcoming. So questions still to be answered. Are there surrogate uh, markers for response? So far, nobody's been able to identify the patient up front who's definitely going to respond. But again, I take you back to the CCR Grand Rounds of Gajewski um, that he, um, 
he has this T cell inflamed phenotype that, that is a marker of somebody more likely to respond to immunotherapy. Here in one of Jed Wolchuk's papers about a patient he talks uh, about, you can see that he had a real increase in absolute lymphocytes. Here he was at baseline. Here after his first um, couple of doses, his first four doses, he had a lot more tumor on his scans. Um, Dr. Wolchuk basically says that the patient said, but doc, I feel better. And so they took the unorthodox stance at that point of just watching. And that uh, patient underwent without any drug a spontaneous resolution of all those. So the other take home message I take from that is listen to your patients. Patient said, but I'm really feeling well. I'm not quite sure why the scans look worse. Um, and it turns out, because there was an ongoing immune response in there that was decreasing what was happening. Um, that doesn't hold out true for everybody that responds in the lymphocyte correlates, and so that's probably not the best marker. In our PEDS trial, we did answer that immunological answer in that you can activate T cells in a pediatric population, but you do not get a concomitant increase in uh, FOXP3 T regulatory cells. Um, I had just mentioned the T cell uh, tumor microenvironment. We were looking at things, looking at CRP, which is a marker of inflammation, and whether that can help you identify, as it did uh, here in the adjuvant trial, the patients who had a higher uh, inflamed uh, CRP uh, were less likely to relapse. It's this one. So that really was the first in-class drug of its kind. The first one, you notice I had very different side effects than we typically talk about in chemotherapies. This was something that really, even in pediatrics, we started it only here. We opened it at Memorial and, and Dana-Farber. And now the phase two is out in multiple places, but they're very different side effect profiles than we're used to giving with chemotherapy and need to be watched closely, especially at at onset of things like colitis so that you don't end up perfing your colon. Um, the next question really becomes, what can you put it with? What can make it better? How can we take a 6 to 10% response rate in melanoma and make it higher? And so some of the early trials put it together with chemotherapy. DTIC is an IV medicine approved for melanoma. And they put it together, and they, they basically showed that they could put them together and you had perhaps less side effects, but it didn't really create a home run in the response criteria. The BRAF inhibitors, this came of age in the time where we were starting to learn how to inhibit BRAF. And so they've been putting those together. Whether you do it sequentially or at the same time, there actually is some overlap um, toxicity between a BRAF inhibitor or when you give a BRAF inhibitor and uh, ipilimumab kind of overlapping. And so those studies are underway as we learn how to do that better. One of the very interesting things from a radiolo from an immunology standpoint is radiation plus ipilimumab. And this again is a patient of Jed Wolchuk's um, showing an abscopal effect, which is basically the name given when you irradiate at one spot and get decrease in disease in the other. And I apologize that trying to fit a lot of things on the slide, this is kind of small. But essentially, there's a decent amount of disease here at the beginning. They irradiate um, this spot through there. That goes away. But at the same time, they have a response in the other areas as well. And so this happened after a patient had been given ipilimumab. So they gave radiation and gave ipilimumab after. And so we have often used the two together when we're um, dealing with a, a progressing patient. Now here is from Drew Pradwell's um, review. And it's switching gears to talk about PD-1, but showing us in a, in a schematic how essentially they're a little bit the same. We talk about them both as immune checkpoint inhibitors, but they actually function in different arenas and are non-overlapping in how they, de they deal with putting the brake on. And so provide a platform to actually use them both together at the same time. So here you'll see a dendritic cell, just like we talked about, working with the T cell, signal 1, signal 2, CTLA comes to the surface, and you now have this tolerized signal that you can block with it, Balumumab. 
That's all happening at the T cell uh, and antigen presenting cell um, interface. PD-1, you still have to have an antigen presenting cell and T cell interface to get the signal going, but then the T cells go to the tissue, and it's really in the tissue that you have the PDL1 or PDL2 expressed. This could be on the tumor itself, this could be on the stroma, and that provides a ligand to a different break, the PD-1, which sends a negative signal and essentially exhausts the T cell. This is uh, my big antibody for nivolumab here, and that essentially allows the T cell to be reinvigorated, sending a positive signal that gets clonal expansion, your cytokine excretion, uh, your effector function, and your tumor-mediated migration. These are studies that were presented in the last two years at ASCO and uh, in New England Journal of Medicine. This is Suzanne Tapolian's um, paper looking at the activity of nivolumab. Uh, that's the uh, anti-PD-1 drug of um, BMS in clinical trials. So the same people who make ipilimumab, which makes it a lot easier to put things together if they're both made from the same company. And essentially you see in this graph, this is called a spider plot, and it shows a patient who, who progressed and came off. Um, but those are a lot fewer in number than if you go back and look at the original ones on ipilimumab. What you see is in the first couple of months, the majority of patients have a decrease in tumor burden, and that persists throughout the time that they've been followed. Um, you can see that some of them get a new lesion. That's what I was talking about when you get one of those new things that you now see on a scan that normally would have meant that patient had to come off trial. Well, since the experiment with experience with ipilimumab, they've kept them on this trial, and most all of them, except for two there, have had a decrease in tumor size past that first uh, new lesion. What's exciting, though, is an ipilimumab, I told you mostly about melanoma and renal cell carcinoma responses, but the anti-PD-1 has had responses in other tumors. So here is non-small cell lung cancer. You can see, in this case, a like pseudo-progression that happens at two months, and at four months it's gone. So again, oftentimes, if this was the only lesion we'd be looking at, we would say, ah, oh, the tumor's growing and maybe I shouldn't stick with that drug. But in this case, um, by adding everything up, it fit the criteria to allow to uh, continue watching and went away. And here you see some in the, in the bottom panel as well. So it's been exciting responses in other diseases, and many more uh, tumor types are, are undergoing study now that it's closer to approval. So here are going back to some of the basic science studies that drive this. I mentioned your talking immune checkpoint. When, you, when I first heard about them, I thought they would overlap in toxicity, and they do. But because their function is not redundant in the signaling, you can do blockade of both and get a better effect on the T cells. And so here's in um, colon cancer, you see when you do anti-PD-1 by itself or anti-CTLA-4, you get growth. But here with combined, you have a lot more tumor-free and you've got a better percent surviving when you do combined together plus vaccine as well. We'd always sort of hope that we could do these inhibitors on the back end of some sort of therapy that activates the T cells. So that's why you keep seeing things together with vaccine because that's the way to stimulate the T cell and get the activation arm working before you block the break. So here is uh, Jed Wolchuk's paper in the New England Journal showing the activity of Nevo plus IPI and the clinical activity. This is concurrent therapy, although they, they did a couple of different crossovers and trying to understand, but this is um, concurrent therapy and you see a lot of the patients with this dramatic response and then continued um, response. The waterfall plot starts looking like something that's exciting, like we saw with the PARP inhibitor. There are a lot more patients responding down here with uh, decreased amounts of disease below the, um, the access than there are growing. And this year at ASCO, it was presented as an update to this study. And essentially, what you see here is the Nevo Plus, so small, um, 
So one milligram of Nevo and three of Ipi, or three of Nevo and one of Ipi, essentially give you great survivals. Three of three is that one that's straight across the top. So these are very exciting to be able to combine them and get even better responses than we were getting with uh, ipilimumab, uh, ipilimumab alone, better responses with Nevo, and perhaps even better with a combination blockade. Here's another tumor type um, that is being targeted with this and showing some wonderful uh, uh, waterfall plots here, and these are swimmer plots showing ongoing responses with all these arrows sticking out. But this is in, in lymphoma. One of the things that happens in a lymphoma is they tend to have lots of ligand for your program death um, one. So PD1's ligand is PDL1 or PDL2. And depending on which kind of lymphoma, you tend to have more of one or the other. But essentially, it becomes a great hypothesis that blocking that, because that tissue level is so high, will allow the activated T cells to then attack the tumor. And here they combined it with treatment for B cell lymphoma and rituximab, and they got um, tolerated the combination, and it was quite effective. Getting back to the combination and what happens with the toxicity, we've talked about a lot of um, the ipilimumab side effects. Nevo is pretty close. One of the things that came up, uh, in higher amounts in Nevo versus Ipi was pneumonitis or inflammation in the lungs. Um, but most of the other things are typical, the rash. Um, they had some colitis, but actually I don't even see it listed on here, and hypothyroidism. When you put them together, you start to see some of the things that you had with Ipi alone, and you start to see it at higher levels. So here at grade three or four, you see 15% had uh, liver issues. Um, they had some colitis. Majority of patients having lower grades. So here, again, the rash happens in 55% itching in another group. So 70% overall have some sort of skin issue. Again, getting back to the T cells in the skin. Um, but the safety algorithms that have been put in place in the ipilimumab trials are really helping keep these combination strategies uh, and the management of the AEs more safe. There weren't any new um, safety signals. So I get back to anti-PD-1 and pediatrics. I tried to take you through some of the pediatrics on ipilimumab because we have some data with that. We do not yet have any data in pediatrics being given anti-PD-1, which is really unfortunate because they just approved a PD-1 uh, inhibitor, the Merck one, at the beginning of this month. And I know lots of patients who are working to get that off trial. So uh, it's a plea for the drug makers in the, in, the, in the audience as you go. Don't forget to help us get things to pediatrics before they get approved so that they can actually get given earlier and get studied. But here's some data coming out of uh, Crystal Makel is my branch chief uh, and was my mentor in fellowship. Stephen Heifel was a uh, postdoc in her lab and essentially was using a mirroring model of rhabdomyosarcoma, another sarcoma I uh, did not talk about yet, but uh, in the class of high-risk sarcomas that we tend to treat and gave it anti-CTLA-4. There was some delay of growth in some mice. Anti-PD-1 did a little bit better in more mice, but still had growth. However, um, in their hands, when you did a blocking agent to keep some of the myeloid-derived cells from getting to the tumor, you did a lot better in survival outcome, and that's that green uh, bar here. And so that's getting at the other arm of what things in the sarcomas are keeping it from responding to any sort of immune activation, and one of them being myeloid suppressors. So in summary, based on the early studies, we're excited by the responses. They've seen in non-melanoma solid tumors. Uh, these are the actual rates I just have in here from the melanoma tumor. Biomarkers for response. Like I said with IPI, it would be great to know who's going to respond to PD-1. I 
hinted to the fact that PDL1 and PDL2 expressed in the tumors might be something you would hypothesize to respond better to. And you can see that in a couple of the, the New England Journal's um, uh, articles. I think this is from the Tapalian one, the 36% response rate in PDL1 positive tumors versus those who were negative. Now, it didn't mean that there weren't any responses in a negative one, and we certainly know that these can be upregulated and downregulated. So it can be a problem when you're just dealing off the uh, tumor tissue that you got at diagnosis, and now you see the, the child at relapse two years later. Is it the same expression as there or not? So we're not setting up our trial to uh, require that you have it, but we're certainly looking at it uh, prospectively as we go. Here are all the inhibitors in development. Pembrolizumab uh, or Keytruda, Keytruda, I haven't heard anybody actually say that one yet, is the Merck compound that was just approved for melanoma not responsive to ipilimumab. So it's a pretty narrow uh, initial indication. Um, they have ongoing phase three trials, and this was a, a breakthrough drug mechanism. Uh, nivolumumab, it's anticipated that we hear something from the FDA in the next several months. And there are a series of other groups that have anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 in uh, large uh, trials, melanoma, other tumors, renal cell, bladder. There were some exciting uh, data on bladder cancer responses to, to NEVO at ASCO this year. Upwards of 50% of the patients who had PDL1 on, the, uh, on their tumors. And so we're very excited to see where this goes. You'll notice that there aren't any cohorts that have looked at sarcoma. Um, we're going to be doing that in our upcoming trial that's going to include young adults uh, in the pediatric trial. Lest you think that the two immune checkpoints you've learned about today are all that's out there, there's a lot more. Here are some of the other ones. Um, LAG3, TIM3, uh, CD137, GEATR, all these have things in the pipeline working their ways. The hope is that they'll be able to uh, have combination therapies, much like NEVO and IPI, without overlapping toxicities, and open up another range of tumors to target. Let's say one of these ligands is much more important in a tumor that hasn't so far seen uh, responses to immune targeting. It might once we can release these breaks. Um, here's another way of looking at it, because I also like to know what they interact with, because that helps. You can target both sides, and you can learn about signaling either way. And so uh, B7H3 is expressed on lots of pediatric tumors. We don't know what the ligand is yet, but maybe that's a good place for us to be targeting. Um, so this is a growing field of immune checkpoint knowledge. The prior successes certainly helped push along a wave of new discovery and interest in designing clinical trials that can look for that elusive overall survival rather than that quick uh, one or two month progressive free um, survival changes. And really, the field is working hard to try to define those uh, appropriate endpoints and biologic correlates so that we can learn more for who is going to benefit and who not. So in conclusion, the inhibition of the breaks. It's kind of a different way of thinking about it, but I hope by the end of the talk we've gotten so it sounds a lot less odd than by the beginning. So we inhibit the break, and that can lead to durable regressions of tumors. Pediatrics trials are lagging a bit, but we're hopeful in the next couple of months to have our NEVO trial open and NEVO plus IPI. We're going to have expansion cohorts in all these tumors that we actually um, have evidence that there are uh, immune targets within these tumors. And hopefully this is a lot of progress on the horizon. The pediatrics department is over here. It's on the west wing. Our labs are in the wing. And the kids are on the, on the first floor in one northwest. And so I'm hopeful at the end of this uh, rainbow we, we find some good things. So just to end with acknowledgments, um, you know, there weren't that many patients that I talked to you about directly on here, but each and every one of them a, did this out of altruism, B, out of hope, and we really, I try to advocate hard for them and thank um, them for their involvement in it. Uh, Crystal Makel, Kaplan Kahn, and the rest of the crew um, on our team, the Rosenberg um, 
branch as well, the surgery branch, who has actually helped out a lot of our uh, children. Some of them have gone on to get uh, tills with his branch, a special exemption. And I mentioned Jed Walchuk a lot, and he has definitely been one that I went to for advice in understanding how this first in pediatric steps uh, could be taken. And then I just want to come back to something I put on the front page but didn't quite mention. Today is the second to last day of the month. It's Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. There is a Whipping Childhood Cancer uh, video challenge that's gone a bit viral that really stresses every day 46 kids are diagnosed with cancer and every day seven kids die of cancer. And so we, uh, we put this gold ribbon, that's the, the ribbon color for peds, into this as really a, a helpful sense of we need to do more for these kids. Thanks. All right, I'll open it up for some questions. Is there any kind of resistance to the So when we talk about other immunotherapy strategies, uh, like when we're doing CD19 CAR T cells, the chimeric antigen receptor T cells, and they're going after CD19 positive leukemia, there can be an outgrowth of CD19 negative leukemia. So they figured out how to grow without it. We don't think that CTLA-4 has the same role in these tumors. We, um, because we haven't sort of found a reason why they might just downregulate it and do by other mechanisms, or it might not have anything to do with it. Um, we're targeting the T cells. We're not targeting the tumor. So I think the resistance mechanisms are more of the other breaks, the other suppressive environment that takes one or another side away from the immune system. There are some PD-1 negative tumors. You know, there's a lot of issues with the immunohistochemistry, and I don't think it's all been worked out to the point where we feel like we know who's really positive and who's really negative. There's sometimes focal, sometimes it's in the stroma, sometimes it's in the tumor cells. So. I'm hopeful we get more to that answer, but right now I'm, I, I'm not willing to say if it's PD-1 negative on our first look, then there's no chance you can respond to it. I think there will be ways of upregulating. We did another mechanism. It kind of feeds into the, to the smack mimemic that Tina was talking about in using TRAIL, TNF-related apoptosis-inducing ligand. Uh, it's made by a lot of NK cells and can induce apoptosis in many of our sarcomas. And just changing chemo, radiation, or interferon gamma can all upregulate the receptors that send those apoptosis signals through better. And so I think there's going to be a lot of modulation. Melanoma is one of the things that's been used in melanomas for many years is interferon alpha. Perhaps that changes you know, how much of a certain ligand is expressed on the surface. So I think it's more dynamic than we're thinking of the plus minus of a mutation or not a mutation. So like I mentioned, melanoma tends to be chock full of a lot of T cells. So Steve Rosenberg for decades has been growing out the T cells and giving them back to patients, and they can be very active. And IL-2, a uh, T cell survival factor, is approved therapy for melanoma. It's also been used in renal cell carcinoma and has a a proportion of patients, don't quote me on the numbers, I think it's somewhere around 10, that can respond to just IL-2 as a T cell uh, growth factor and a response in the tumor. So it's been known that those are your typical immune sensitive. So if you ask somebody what's an immune sensitive tumor, melanoma is its poster child. Um, I think we're starting to think about that a little bit differently with some of the adult tumors like the lung cancers that I showed you, some of the things, the colon cancers. 
the ones that have a lot of mutations, back in that hypothesis of a mutation makes it more likely that a T cell can recognize it as different and attack it, if you think about these tumors that have built up over lifetimes and have a lot of mutations, they might have more T cells in there at some of the, the, the maybe not the driver mutations of the tumor, but the passenger mutations of the tumor and allow an immune response if you can get it going. And that sort of jump starting the response seems to be easier to do in melanoma. Now, I will admit it also seems to be a whole bunch easier to do in melanoma in a mouse or colon cancer in a mouse. <laughs> um, and we're certainly, uh, there are differences to some of the immune mediators in mice versus humans as well. And so making that leap isn't always so easy. But I think it comes back to it's the classic immune sensitive model. So they have, um, they have attempted to do that on some of the trials. They do see TILs. I don't think any of them rose to, any of the differences rose to the level of statistical difference. Um, certainly there are anecdotes, and I guess when they're published, they're no longer just anecdotes, but there are, uh, you know, small series of cases where people show you don't have any infiltrate really before um, IPI. And then when you go and biopsy something that you're worried is melanoma growing again, it turns out just to be chock full of an immune infiltrate. So certainly you can take something that doesn't have a lot in it and turn it into something that has more in it um, by blocking the, the checkpoint. So it's something that with the Oncogenomics Lab uh, and uh, Dr. Rosenberg's group, we're trying to get a handle on. Um, the hypothesis is that, or in, certainly in the very small numbers of melanoma that we fully sequenced, we see a lot fewer mutations than you see in an adult tumor. If you look at sort of all of our pediatric tumors that we've sequenced, we have what, what we call an omics trial that basically allows us to do um, genomic sequencing and RNA sequencing. Um, off of any tumor that's resected here. And um, when you look at it by age, it tends to go up slowly with age. But the things that have the translocations, like I talked about in uh, sarcomas, tend not to have a lot of other mutations defined. It's as if those, you know, those cross wires in the chromosome take the place of years of built up mutations in the, you know, like the colon cancers of the world. So I don't know. We might prove that right. We might prove that wrong. But that's our hunch right now is that there's fewer. Thank you.